here with analysis, Fox News contributor Jonathan Turley. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I've been following your commentary very, very closely. You've been dead on accurate about this. Uh, okay, none of the salacious material or talking to dead people is particularly relevant to the law in this case. I don't think any of it should have been admissible. Uh, I do think the moment that Daniels had been claiming, oh, no, I'm, I wasn't about the money, it was all about safety, that kind of got blown out of the water by the, the tape recording today. But yet the jury is hearing all of this, and they've not been hearing about the law, and that concerns me. Well, it should concern you, although I'm not too sure you're right about the immateriality in a case built on two dead misdemeanors, talking to the dead might be uh, just the skill set you need as a witness. Uh, this case itself died years ago and was sparked back into life with this bizarre theory. But we still don't even know the full extent of the theory because we don't know what actually is the crime that Trump was supposed to be concealing. And keep in mind that today's testimony also revealed for the jury another interesting contradiction. You have all of this discussion of his signing the checks in the White House. So it really sort of drove home this theory that he f somehow falsely denoted the payments after the election to influence the election. So the election was already over, he already won, and he classified them as legal expenses, and somehow retroactively that was stealing the election. It's that convoluted. The problem that I have is not that the jury can't disregard of what they've heard. Um, they can't disregard all of it. I, I'm sure the judges are going to come in and say, please forget you heard some of those details, which is not going to happen. But she lacks such credibility. I'm hoping they see that. The problem is that the judge has already committed, in my view, reversible error before Daniels ever took the stand. He allowed the government to repeatedly say that there were campaign violations in this case. For all they know, Donald Trump did commit a campaign finance violation, uh, election finance uh, violation. That's just not true. And that itself, I think, could end up a reversible error. You know, all right. So the, the bookkeeping side of this uh, under New York law would be a misdemeanor, but a misdemeanor whose statute of limitations have long since passed. Now, you're a very prestigious law professor. And you are telling me that we're, we're witnessing a trial that is taking place against a former president from eight years ago, uh, that you have a judge who donated to his opponent in this upcoming election, whose family may very well be compromised or have family members benefit from this, uh, that being his daughter. Uh, then you have the third highest ranking DOJ official, Biden's DOJ, coming over to try the case and and explain to me, and we don't know what the actual crime they're prosecuting the former president is, because uh, you happen to be, uh, I've asked this question of many uh, uh, lawyers, and there's not one that can explain it to me. You're saying we don't know what the crime is? Doesn't somebody have a right to know what they're charged with? They do, and the judge has an obligation to bring some clarity, which he should have before this trial began, to say, I need you to state with absolute clarity what was the fraud, what was the effort to conceal what crime. Trump did not commit a campaign finance violation. The Department of Justice chose not to charge it. The only reason we're here is because Bragg has this bizarre theory that by alleging that there was a crime that was being concealed, he can bring back into life a couple of bookkeeping misdemeanors. And now, the judge seems perfectly happy to let him just drift along in the hopes that he's going to bump into an actual crime. But if from this point so far, that jury has been told that there was a campaign finance violation by the prosecutors, and they're very careful not to explain by whom. It was not by Trump. It might have been by Pecker, although there's some debate on that. But it certainly was not by Trump. And so he's being tried for something that most of us really don't know the measure of or the meaning of. Uh, that's how yeah, bad you, this has gotten. I have never in my career seen a trial like this one.
You know, and, and nobody else would have been tried with this. Uh, the fact that they brought the third highest no, ranking no. DOJ official over to, to do all of this. The, the, the question is, will all the smoke and mirrors and opening statements uh, the, the prosecution is talking about uh, conspiracy, election fraud, and they're throwing out all of these names, but they're not talking about the law or the crime, uh, the salacious nature of Stormy's testimony, or talking to dead people. Um, how is that relevant to what would be a campaign vi finance violation? And how do you get to a campaign finance violation, which is federal election law, and get to bring it into the state of New York? Well, it's not relevant. And the interesting thing about the first day of the Daniels testimony is that the prosecutors clearly wanted it delayed to roll out that way. She was coached by the prosecutors. She gave this lurid, disgusting testimony. And that doesn't win their case for them. It may be viewed as winning the election, but not the case. And so the prosecutors knew that she would be cuisinarded the next day in cross-examination. But they didn't care about that either. What they wanted was to get these salacious details out to embarrass, humiliate uh, the former president. And you have a judge who just sat there uh, watching this dumpster fi fire in his courtroom. And at the end yeah. of the day, I'm hoping that some jurors will be insulted by all of this. I, I'm hoping that they will redeem the integrity of the New York system, because so far that has not happened. All right, Jonathan Turley, thank you for your, that important commentary. Sad times we're living in. This is what the weaponization of a Justice Department looks like.